What true story should be turned into a movie? The men's marathon at the 1904 Summer Olympics, a Coen Brothers type comedy in which first place goes to a guy who drove most of the route, only to have his car break down, forcing him to run 7 more miles to the finish line. Actual first place goes to a guy who was poisoned by his own trainers and lost 8 pounds before reaching the end. And fourth goes to a Cuban mailman who illegally joined the race, stopped in an orchard to eat some rotten apples, and got sick. Meanwhile the race's organizer, please let it be John Goodman, refused to let most runners drink any water on the 95 plus degree day. I remember watching a 70s or 80s movie about the 1896 games. I have no clue how accurate it was, but I remember in the movie the American team trained with oversized shot puts and discusses because the only thing they had to go on were pictures when they made the training equipment. When they got to the games they were pleasantly surprised at how light the actual objects were and dominated. I just saw a documentary on Michael Dowd, a corrupt NYC cop in the early 90s who ended up running a complex drug ring with higher level drug dealers. Apparently it's being made into a movie, so till. For what it's worth, The 7-5 on Netflix is a great documentary about this guy and his accomplices. Kurt Warner, whose actual life sounds like a bad Hallmark Channel movie. After playing quarterback for a small college, he didn't make it into the NFL. He then got a job at a grocery store and played arena football, basically semi-pro back then, for a few hundred dollars a game. During this time, he married a woman who was a former marine that just got out of an abusive marriage and had a special needs child. During this time, they became born again Christians. Finally, after a few years in arena football and NFL Europe, Kurt was able to earn a spot as a third string quarterback on an NFL team, though they were one of the worst in the league and he didn't get any significant playing time. By the next season, he had worked his way up to backup quarterback. The starter was injured before the season, and his coach had a tearful press conference about how they would rally behind Kurt Warner. Warner then began one of the greatest seasons that a quarterback has ever had, winning the Super Bowl and becoming the league MVP, beginning a career that would land him in the Hall of Fame. Football sells, religion sells, the military sells, and underdog stories sell. I am amazed that it isn't a movie already. I once saw a dwarf dressed as a rockabilly singer climb out of the passenger side of an early 1960s Cadillac, which would be a great opening scene to some kind of film. I feel we need to have Nicolas Cage coming out from the driver's side. The most feared pirate of all the seas, Ching Shi. She was a prostitute who married a pirate captain and then worked her way up the power ladder until she controlled a fleet. She then codified pirate law to get lots of pirates to work under her. She commanded somewhere between 20,000 and 40,000 pirates. She terrorized the seas of China for years. There's already some films about here, but I want a Scorsese film of hers. I think he can handle it really well. Opening scene. Michelle Yeoh pushing dead bodies off the deck of a ship into the sea. She wipes a bloodied hand across her forehead, leaving a mark, and sighs. Freeze frame. Voice over. Ever since I can remember, I wanted to be a pirate. Cue Sinatra music. I'm still waiting for an accurate depiction of the life of Vlad the Impaler, which is way more fascinating than all the cheesy vampire movies based on him. The story of the Batavia, a Dutch merchant vessel that basically had an attempted mutiny, then wrecked off the coast of Australia, way back before it was populated by Europeans, the sought refuge on a barren island. A group of leaders left to go get help. But the guy they left in charge basically reigned with terror, and began killing lots of the other survivors. He also sent the only military personnel from the crew on a search for water on a nearby island so that he could basically get rid of them and leave them to die. They ended up finding food and water, and survivors from the other island started showing up and letting them know about all the bad crap that was happening. When the bad guys discovered that the soldiers actually did find water, they staged an attack to get it. But the soldiers made a fort out of rocks, and used improvised weapons to repel them three times. During the third battle, a rescue ship was spotted in the distance and the leader of the soldiers and the leader of the bad guys literally raced to it so that they could get there first and share their side of the story. The leader of the soldiers did, and the bad guys were all arrested, and everyone was rescued. Most of the bad guys were executed, 
and the leader of the soldiers, only a young enlisted guy at the time, was promoted to sergeant and eventually commissioned as an officer, and was also recognized as a national hero. I just think the story was really neat. It's got lots of drama, violence, good versus, evil type themes, and a generally happy ending. This could also be a really good time to comment on the mantra the victors write the history books, by looking in the good and bad acts that were committed by both sides. Compared to the final outcome, you could really get a feel for how acts of the present are remembered in history. Base Reeves, born a slave, became a farmer after the war and then was recruited into the US. Marshals due to his knowledge of Indian territory, tracked down and arrested notorious criminals and got into shootouts, without ever being shot. He retired and lived into old age. He used to wear disguises and captured over 3,800 criminals. Denzel would kill this role. The story of Richard Jill is extremely heartbreaking, and I think it needs to be told, especially in this day and age where people will ruthlessly eviscerate someone in the media, without caring or knowing about the facts and potential fallout. For example, someone begins to accuse you of being racist, they make the claim and provide their evidence. Suddenly there's a bandwagon calling for your death, you've lost your job, and you are basically attacked by a mob. The next week they have all moved on, but your reputation is ultimately damaged despite it being found that you never actually did what they accused you of. So the story of Richard Jewell is extremely important in relation to that. For those unfamiliar, Richard was a security guard working at the Centennial Park during the 1996 Atlanta Olympics. Richard found a suspicious backpack that he believed to contain a bomb. Through his actions he was able to evacuate most of the area. The bag did in fact contain explosives, and detonated. Richard saved countless lives from death and injury. Immediately following the event Richard was hailed as a hero. Then a news outlet found out he was being questioned by the FBI and began labeling him as a suspect despite there being no evidence. In moments he went from being a hero to a villain. They made fun of him. From his appearance to his lifestyle. They painted him as a failed wannabe police officer who constructed the whole thing to stroke his ego. It was an all out witch hunt against him and his family. No one at any time took a moment and asked if it actually made sense or looked at the actual evidence. It got so bad that the FBI did something they never do. Publicly stated that Richard was not in fact a suspect. And just as fast as they turned on him, they forgot about him. There should be statues in his honor. He should be taught in schools. But instead he passed away in 2007 as an obscure fact. At the very least he needs a movie to tell his story. And make people remember him. There's a good TED talk by the guy who wrote the book so you've been publicly shamed. He talks about how scary these public shaming can be. For example the girl who tweeted about not getting AIDS in Africa because she's white. I once wrote a screenplay about Emperor Norton. And it would adapt pretty well to the big screen. For those folks who may not be aware, Emperor Norton was, as his name implies, the Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico from 1859 to 1880. His earlier years were spent as a businessman in San Francisco, but after an investment went bad, he vanished from the public eye. When he re-emerged some years later, it was to establish, and claim, the throne which he would hold until the day of his death. Emperor Norton issued his own currency, which was accepted at all of the locations he frequented. Citizens of the city treated him with an outlandish amount of respect, to the point where it went beyond simply humoring the man. He even issued a decree calling for the construction of a bridge between San Francisco and Oakland, which is why many locals still maintain that the Bay Bridge should be renamed in the Emperor's honor. When he finally died, over 30,000 people attended Emperor Norton's funeral. If you ask me, that's a life which deserves its own movie. TL. DR. An eccentric homeless man conquered the United States. Witold Pilecki. Polish intelligence officer who volunteered to be rounded up and sent to Auschwitz in order to gather intelligence and create an inmate resistance, since very little was known about the camps the Germans were sending people to. He consistently snuck information out, and when he decided that he had enough information and wanted to try to organize a rescue operation from outside, he escaped, conducted more operations during and after World War II. He was assigned to report on the new communist government in Poland, and he was arrested after he was caught passing information on the communists in the Soviet atrocities during World War II. He was subject to a show trial, 
and executed 10 days later. The story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the pastor in Nazi Germany who resisted Hitler and his persecution of the Jews other undesirables, and led part of the plot to assassinate him in 1944. He was captured and executed at the Flossenburg concentration camp mere days before the Allies liberated it. The details around the Silk Road bust are freaking wild, would make an awesome movie, it seems like Mark Carpales may have even set Ross up, but his involvement wasn't ever really explained much in this case. Something on Charles XII of Sweden, became king at the age of 15 and expanded the Swedish Empire, master military strategist, never married, first to try invading Russia in winter, and no one knows who exactly shot him and killed him. It'd have to be a series with him and Peter the Great as the main characters. The story of horse racing in Tijuana during the 1920s at the Tijuana race track and later on Agua Caliente. Most people don't know how much of an impact those two tracks had on the history of the sport and there are so many great stories to tell. For example, on the 5th of February, 1927 the film Sunset Derby was being shot at the Tijuana racetrack. A track official noticed the way a director was using a microphone and a loudspeaker to direct his crew and actors during the filming. The idea came to him that if he had a microphone set up in the steward's booth that led to a set of speakers, he could call the positions of the horses like a director gave direction. Later that day, he had it set up without telling any of the patrons to the track about it. When people first experienced it, they were extremely confused. Before that people would keep track of the horses themselves with binoculars and often were unable to get a great view at certain angles. After they got used to it, they loved hearing a race being called and it became an everyday thing at that small track. Now, it's an extremely important part of modern day racing all across the world. Along with this these two tracks are responsible for the starting gate, the scratch rule, the first photo finish, modern day safety helmets for jockeys. These historical anecdotes about racing could just play a small part into the story. The bigger story is how lush it was there back then. Because during the time drinking and gambling was illegal in US, Hollywood celebrities like Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keating would go down to Tawana to spend time at the races in the casino. Al Capone was also a regular and Rita Hayworth started as a dancer at the casino there. The tracks were also responsible for some really exciting racing, like the $100,000 Agua Kaleemd handicap, which the famous Australian horse Farlap won along with Seabiscuit years later. The Tawana track also flooded twice so there's some drama there and it would go all the way up until 1935 when the newly elected president Lazaro Cardenas started a reform program that included an end to legalize gambling. Agua Kaleen did open up again later, but I think this time period is the most exciting. I imagine this being a show more than a movie, a bit like Boardwalk Empire. However with the right script I think it can work as a movie too showing this really awesome period of history in Mexico that most people are not even aware of. And from the Seabiscuit book, the jockeys would rest in piles of manure because the heat helped them sweat off pounds. I would like a modern day World War 1 movie. Some of the Sirent movies are good, but I reckon a high budget World War 1 film would scratch an itch. Jack Kelly father of legend Grace Kelly. He was a self-made man in Philadelphia, one of the greatest rowers the world has ever seen, and the British would not let him compete because he worked with his hands. He was so driven by the need for revenge that he trained his son, Jack Jr., to become the greatest rowers in the world, which he did. His son went on to win the race his father wasn't allowed to compete in. Now why do I want this made into a movie, besides the fact that Jack Sr. was also an ambulance driver in World War 1 and Golden Gloves champion, started his own business and became an elected official? Well one time early in his career he tried to row away from the dock full speed while the boat was still tied up. He flew out of the seat with such force that he did a full backflip in midair, cannonballing straight into the water. I would watch that scene until I pee myself laughing. Lachiman Garung. He was a soldier for the British colonial forces. In World War II he single-handedly, and also literally single-handedly fought off over 200 Japanese troops. The reason why I saw single-handedly is in the process of fighting them. He lost one of his arms. I want to see an epic, Game of Thrones style HBO miniseries about 1st century Judea, based strongly on the works of Flavius Josephus. 
Three sects vying for power in the midst of a coming Roman apocalypse, betrays, crazy twists, and unbelievable atrocities. I think the story of the The White Death, Simo Hoa Ho, dude was a lethal sniper with a hunting rifle that had no scope, the Russians couldn't get him and they eventually had to drop artillery in his area to flush him out. He took a bullet to the face and woke up on the day the war ended. Pretty sure he had more confirmed sniper kills in World War II than anyone else. Just a small Finnish farmer who grew up hunting wolves and turned into the biggest pain in the butt for the Russians trying to get into Finland. I've always wanted to see a movie about the battle of Samar and the sailors of Taffy 3. The odds they faced and the horrors they endured waiting for rescue deserves more recognition. The 1MDB scandal. Possibly the biggest case of corruption in the world involving the former Malaysian Prime Minister and his wife. Many famous celebrities such as Leonardo DiCaprio were pulled into this mess too. That of my dog's life. Born into a breeding house for fighting dogs and rescued. By me. Shortly after coming off the wean. Survives Pavo at 1 year of age. Survives cancer at 3. Gets kicked out of an entire state. Arkansas. And is given a large prison to 2 upon returning to her home state, is captured and held for 10 days in doggy jail, survives cancer again at age 10, the rest is still being written, oh, and she's missing a nipple. Her name, Lucky. A Battle of Berlin movie that focuses on the actual fighting that took place rather than the events in Hitler's bunker and shows the fighting from the perspective of German and Russian troops. Think of a bridge too far but on the battle for Berlin rather than the market garden. Eric of Pomerania would be pretty interesting. He started out as the adoptive son of Margaret I of Denmark, who in her own right was a pretty badass ruler, and later became king himself, waged some wars, was dethroned and later became a pirate in the Baltic Sea. Gonzalo Guerrero was a Spanish solider in the early 1500s who survived a shipwreck during a violent storm off the Yucatan Peninsula. After a harrowing journey at sea, he reached the coast, only to be captured by Mayans and enslaved. His initial encounter with the Mayans, I believe, is considered the first contact between Europeans and the indigenous tribes of the Americas. He shared Spanish military tactics with his captors, who were warring other tribes, proved himself in battle and became a respected warrior. After earning his freedom, he married a Mayan woman who was the chief's daughter, she who gave birth to three children, the first mixed race children in the Americas. Guerrero refused attempts to be rescued by the Spanish, instead choosing to lead the Mayans in the wars against Cortes and the Conquistadors. Guerrero eventually became a Mayan lord. He died in battle fighting against the Spanish attempting to colonize the region. The part of World War II where the Allies fought the French. There were a number of significant engagements, including one of the most destructive naval battles of the war. There's also the battle between the Africa Corps and the German Brigade of the Foreign Legion. Probably of the events that took place at Kent State University on the 4th of May, 1970. There was a TV drama in the early 80s, but I'd love to see a full Hollywood film. I'm surprised no one has done a documentary on featuring McClellan. Now, the US Army and Monsanto knowingly poisoned tens of thousands of people there before they finally closed the place in 1999. The local residents sued Monsanto and won huge but the government forbid former soldiers and govt employees from taking any action against Monsanto or the army. And even though both sides have acknowledged they contributed to poisoning the groundwater, and the army acknowledges they forced thousands and thousands of soldiers to drink it, they refuse to pay for medical costs associated with PCB poisoning. Us Indianapolis was a US light cruiser of World War II. Its sinking caused the greatest loss of life in the US Navy to date. It sank so quickly and suddenly that only one SOS could be sent, which was ignored for unknown reasons. The survivors of the sinking basically floated around in the water, some without ruffs or life jackets, for up to four days. There were shark attacks, starvation, etc etc. Just before the sinking, the ship helped carry parts of the first nuclear bomb, but the crew was never taught of this fact first after the war had ended. The captain of the ship was blamed for not giving orders to abandon ship, not avoiding submarines. Also he had been told to specifically not to etc etc and shot himself after a few years. 
The great possibility for so many great characters is too great to ignore. I think this would make for a great war movie. As good or better than Private Ryan perhaps. I don't believe this is a movie but the story of Captain Lun Sijin should. This dude was freaking awesome. He was a pilot during the Vietnam War. And a pretty good one. On a mission. His plane got shot down and only he survived. Two seater plane. A rescue mission what started after he regained consciousness and radioed for SAR. He had a concussion and a really badly messed up arm and leg. After hours and hours of trying, the helicopter that was gonna pick him up sent down the rope and planned to send someone down into the jungle to help him up. Sijin denied because he knew there were North Vietnam soldiers in the area. He tried to crawl there but couldn't. The SAR team had to leave after the lost communication. Instead of giving up and dying or giving in and getting captured and or killed, Sijin decided to attempt to get out of the jungle, into the open so he could charge his radio's batteries and start to fire and whatever else he needed. Captain Sijin spent over 40 days crawling through the jungle with all of his major injuries, grass and moss as food, and water from puddles if he could find them. He was then found and captured by the NVA. After his capture, Sijin was in a hut with some medical attention and food. After a few days, he saw his opportunity for escape. This scrawny, malnourished, dehydrated man K-A-R-A-T-E-C-H-O-P-S a guard and runs into the forest with a cast on his leg and the guard's gun. Sijin was captured again and brought to a different prison. He was an inspiration to his fellow American, and later other nations, powers. He never gave up any information beside his rank, name, branch, and service number. Even after hours and days or intense interrogation and torture, as his physical strength failed drastically, he still talked to his two fellow prisoners about escape and helped them be able to communicate. His optimism was unlike anything they had ever seen. He died in a prison in Hanoi but never betrayed his country nor his honor. His story was lived on by the two POWs and fellow Air Force pilots, Grutas and Craner. Sijin's family received the Medal of Honor in his name. The R awards in honor of this man. A part of the Air Force Academy is named after him. His story was beautifully written by his high school friend, Malcolm McConnell. The book is titled, Into the Mouth of the Cat. Great read I read it for JROTC and do not regret it. The guy that saved all those people by doing that thing. Can't remember the details. If you know what happened, mention it. I'd love to watch a movie about the life of Toyotomi Hideyoshi. The man rose up from a peasant to become emperor of Japan. Brilliant bureaucrat. I would love to see a film about Leopold, Queen Victoria's youngest son. Lots about Queen Vic herself nothing else gets a look in. The story of the Horus Heresy from the Warhammer 40k. 30k really. Universe. Bonus points if you get a director that is known for doing super over the top stuff to direct it. Is there a movie about Ernest Shackleton and the Endurance? It's one of the most amazing survival stories I've ever heard. He led a polar expedition during which his ship became stuck in pack ice. They stayed with the ship until the ice crushed it, then camped on the pack ice for months until it drifted far enough north to start breaking up. Then they finally had enough open water to launch their small boats, and spent 5 days on the sea soaked with freezing water, with hardly any food or sleep before reaching an inhabited elephant island. Most of the men stayed there while Shackleton and 5 others sailed a tiny boat 800 miles to a whaling station on South Georgia Island, but they were forced to land on the opposite side of the island from the station, so they crossed the previously unexplored interior of the island, full of icy mountains and glaciers. After Shackleton reached the whaling station, it took him 4 months to get back to rescue the men on Elephant Island due to the sea ice. He didn't lose a single man. The book Endurance by Alfred Lansing is an absolutely incredible account of this. World Walk. Stephen Newman, back in the 80s, spent 4 years walking solo around the world. He walked across some crazy places like Algeria and Pakistan. He was thrown in jail four times and nearly murdered on a couple of occasions. I would love to see my dad's life story turned into a movie. Poor farm boy from the Midwest that had to milk cows at five years old in the snow before school. Meets my mom at his best friend's wedding. They get married a few months later at 19 and start having kids immediately. He drags her across the country to take a job in a little machine shop. Works his way up and buys the shop in his mid late 20s. 
brings on the right people and grows it into a powerhouse shop and sells it and becomes a millionaire dozens of times over in his mid 30s. They developed some of the most advanced aerospace engine repairs in the world 25 years ago. A lot of them are still in use today. He also started a massively profitable construction products company which he is still growing and expanding. He has started and sold hundreds of commercial buildings over the years. I feel like I know 2% of the story. I would love if he would write a book or something. He is the epitome of the American dream from working your butt off and having perseverance. I think I would want a solid 9-11 movie. I have seen the others like the Oliver Stone one. And I didn't like it. I would like a movie that follows different people in their own plot on the day of 9-11. From the WTC. The Pentagon. Camp David. And what was happening elsewhere. It would be a great way to show the impact that 9-11 had through the eyes of the actual people there happening in real time. The story of the origins of the SAS as per Ben McIntyre's book Rogue Heroes. I usually don't read non-fiction, but I found the book and its characters, and the story of David Stirling, riveting. These intermingled stories that proceed from Canadian Confederation, the requirements to connect the Atlantic provinces to British Columbia through the building of the Canadian Pacific Railway, the push to populate the newly purchased Northwest Territory through immigration from Europe, and the consequential resistance by the Metis and other First Nations. Constantine XI, last emperor of Byzantium and by extension, the last Roman emperor. After the walls of Constantinople were broken down by the siege of the Ottoman Turks, as all the men were killed and the women enslaved, his last act as emperor was to throw off his royal tunic, pick up a sword, and charge into the enemy horde formed the palace steps. The movie would be worth it for that scene alone, a fitting and noble end to the empire. The tale of a man in a mechanical suit of armor over 10 years who eventually, after meeting up with other powered individuals, fights a big purple guy with a finger snapping fetish. I still say we need a movie about the treasure of Oak Island, maybe with a Indiana Jones feel to it, or even Goonies. The story of Robert Smalls, real life BAMF, born a slave. He escaped slavery by engineering the theft of the Confederate military transport ship he was on. This episode alone would make an awesome movie. His actions helped convince Abraham Lincoln to allow black men to join the Union Army and he became the US Navy's first black captain. If that's not enough for you, after the war he returned home and purchased his former master's house, which he lived in until he died. He was a successful businessman, prominent in local politics and eventually became one of the first black to men to serve in the US House of Representatives. Timothy Leary and the Weather Underground. Crazy psychedelic culture terrorists of the 60s and 70s. They'd put LSD laced stamps in the general population. Bombed a bunch of places once they were unoccupied. Leary wrote the psychological test to determine what job a new prisoner is given and when he was arrested, answered in such a way to get work in the prison garden. Then the weathermen flew a helicopter into garden and broke him out. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Bye for now.